Uh, it's an honor to be here speaking. I have been here singing sometimes, a couple of times, but it's my speaking here and it is a privilege for me. It's an honor. And Anna Ken was like, no, the honor is ours. I said, no, listen, the honor is mine. <laughs> Please, like, this is an honor, really. First of all, because the Word of God is, you know, the, the most amazing treasure we have in our lives. So any time we can talk about God's do, God, what God is doing, any time we can talk about God, about His person, it is an honor. It doesn't matter if you're on the platform or just the one-on-one -on -one thing, it is an honor to speak about who He is, to praise Him, to you know, declare His goodness and all He is and all He does. I would like to from a, a passage that has been, you know, uh, I, I've been coming back and forth to this passage so many times. And sometimes it, it's as if God highlights some specific, you know, verses and, and books and all. And so this passage has been like burning in my heart. You there? Amen? Okay. Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many, and sent his servant at supper time to those who were invited, Come, For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall suffer. Amen. I just want to read it to the 24th verse. This is a very passage, a very important one. I believe it speaks to us even in 2020, so thousands of years after this was spoken and written, but um, I believe that God has something that, to be honest, I think this passage is so, um, to our days, it speaks so much to our busyness, to our lives, to, to the lifestyle that we lead, that is, it's like so crazy, so busy, and we are always in a hurry, and then those three things, uh, that are mentioned here, to me, they are very uh, timely for us now. It is what God wants us to hear as His church. So, uh, we read from verse 16, and I did that on purpose, but what we didn't read was verse 15. The verse 15 is, I would say, it's kind of like a, a, a key that unlocks everything that's going to be said afterwards. So the first, you know, Jesus is, you know, how, how it goes, you've read the, the Gospels. People are, you know, asking questions and sometimes contending. But at some point, someone looks at Jesus, is in awe of what he's doing, and in verse 15, that person, the Bible said, doesn't, you know, mention who says it, but the person says, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. So this is the phrase, this is the sentence that the person says right before Jesus. Jesus starts, you know, talking about what we have just read. So the, the phrase is, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. So we're thinking and talking about the kingdom of God, right? The future kingdom of God. How many of you understand that this is something that's to come? Okay, this is something that is still to come, right? So blessed is he who shall eat bread when the kingdom of God comes. And then, so I think there is kind of like a, um, a connection. Of course there is a connection. Uh, 
from, you know, thinking about what's ahead of us, what God has in store for us. And all of a sudden, Je Jesus starts talking about who actually and who actually comes. Who all are invited, but also who actually gets himself ready to be a part of that kingdom. So I think we ought to pay attention to this. I think this is very important. So I, I you know, just... Of course, there are three uh, different um, excuses they made for not coming to that supper. So I want to highlight those three things. Because the phrase that Jesus said, you know, he's, he's using a story. And he says, uh, the phrase is, come for all things are ready. Come for all things are ready. I know that what God had to do, he's done it. There's nothing else to be done in terms of salvation, in terms of making room for us to, you know, enter his kingdom. So, yes, it is all ready. Everything is done. That's what Jesus said in the cross when he was about to, you know, to, to, to die. So, all things are ready. Now, three different persons and three different excuses. Those excuses are interesting. And that's what I want to talk to you about because I think, again, this portrays so well 2020, 2019, 2021. That, that this passage portrays very well the times we live in. So the first person says, listen to the excuses they give for not being able to make it to the dinner, the supper they are invited to. The first one says, I bought a piece of ground. Another version says, I bought a piece of land. And I must go see it. I bought a piece of land, a ground, something for me, something for me, and I need to go and see it. The second person says, I bought five yoke of oxen and I must go and test them. Yoke of oxen. And the third person says, I have married a wife. I can't come. I have a question for you guys this afternoon. To buy a piece of land, is it a sin? Is it something wrong? Is there anything wrong about buying a piece of land? No. Is there anything wrong about buying oxen? No. It's not a sin in and of itself. Is there anything wrong with getting married? No. Absolutely not. So what is the thing that's really, you know, what is Jesus really saying here? Listen, because sometimes we're so caught up in like, I need to, I hope you hear my heart on this. Um, sometimes we're only, only focusing on like sin, what we need to avoid and holiness. And please hear my heart. I'm not saying we, we shouldn't do this. Please. I hope you understand what I'm saying. We need to be holy. We need to run and flee from sin and temptation. That's not what I'm, I'm not saying otherwise. What I'm saying is, it came to a point that what they used as an excuse to not um, be available or be willing to have fellowship or to be part of that celebration was something, quote, le legit, legitimate, like something that's not a sin, but can become a sin depending on how high you place it on your life and your heart. So um, I hope you, you understand what I'm saying. 
So someone buys a piece of ground, someone buys a yoke of oxen, someone is like, I got married, so I cannot come. I would like to highlight, if I can, you know, uh, um, let's say, put it under some categories. So the first one, this is just me, my, 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 my writings, my notes. So I would call the first one pleasures. Because it's like, I bought something for me, I must go and see it. So to me, that speaks of pleasures, not sin. Again, remember, I'm not talking about sin. Jesus was not talking about something sinful. He's talking about something that is normal, okay, as long as it doesn't take the place, you know, intimacy with God, uh, is supposed to be at that place, you know? So pleasures, pleasures of life, things in, you know, the, 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 the normal, the ordinary life of ours. The second thing is, um, I bought a, a five oak yoke of oxen and I must go and test it. To me, that speaks of work. Not to us, we, we don't own oxen, but, to them, to them, this was what they used to work, to produce more. Do you guys agree on that? That's what they used for, you know, to produce more, to work more, to have more. Again, this is not wrong. This is not wrong. But how does that speak to us in terms of what we do sometimes? To work more, to produce more, to get more done, and it's like, I can't come because, you know, I, I bought this and I need to go and see it, and I, I need to test it, I need to, I need to take care of this, because, you know, things are growing, we're producing more, and I gotta go. So, how does that speak to us? And the third one is very obvious. So I have married a wife. Again, this is not a sin. Even in the, you know, the law, when a person got married, he was supposed to, you know, enjoy his marriage and all. But he could not come to that feast, to that intimacy, to that time of fellowship and celebration because he got married. In other words, that relationship was between, it was standing, you know, between that person and, and the, that's a parable, that's a story Jesus is saying, he's telling. Um, now, those three things, again, pleasure, work, and relationships. I wrote relationships because I, I believe not only marriage, but any, 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 any type of relationship could take that place, any type. So, work, pleasures, relationships. I believe it is time for us to just, you know, search our hearts. Are there any relationships or is there anything in my job or in my work or are there any pleasures in my life that I have been, you know, searching and seeking after more than what I should or be seeking after God, you know? So as, you, as we read, as you saw it, um, that master becomes angry. He's angry. He gets angry. I think that's, you know, that, that's a, how can I say it? It's a, um, a way for us to how he feels. Because painted to us like a God that's like, oh, it doesn't matter if you don't come. That's not our God. Let me tell you, that's not our God. Jesus is using that, you know, metaphor to say that master was angry. And it, he was so angry at the end. He's like, I promise those that were invited and didn't want to come, they're not going to taste my supper. But it comes. I was angry. 
But, you know, that's the end of the story. And he, just, you know, right before that, he is, uh, he says, go out. Go out and drink. Wow, that's the heart of God right there. Go out and drink. And at some point, he says, I want the roof filled. I want the house filled. Isn't that Jesus? Isn't that the Father, heart of God? He wants the room filled. He wants his house filled. Filled with people from all nations, from all tribes and tongues. That's the wonderful heart of God. He wants the house filled. It's all about a, a feast, a wedding that he's going to, he is preparing for his very son. And he wants us all in it. He wants me, he wants you, he wants people from every nation. How, that's how big his heart is. So that master in that story, so he's like, go out and bring, bring who? Or bring how many? Anyone, as many as you can. Bring, bring them all. Bring everyone. I want my house to be built. I want this celebration to be seen and not only seen but you know uh, enjoyed by by all the guests i want everyone to be a part actually be a part of it now what i did here and please allow me to to take this as a um kind of a i'm going to use kind of like a, a metaphor view of things here because you know the text is pretty self-explanatory, but I want to take those, um, you know, what he says, there are four things. He says four things, and I want to take each one of those four things, and, and, and how could that apply to us? Because believe me, the, the words that Jesus used, they are very thought of. He thought of every word he was using. He's telling a story. Right? He's telling the story, but he chose those words very carefully. So he says that the master says, go out. Go out and bring the poor. That's the first category, he says. Bring the poor. Now, I, I, I don't speak Greek. I mean, I, I, no, I know nothing about Greek and Hebrew. I just go online, I search, I, I read about. So I don't know how to pronounce this. But the word poor, I'm not even going to try it. Forget it. I'm not going to try it. So, poor in Greek. Um, listen, it, it means afflicted, destitute of the Christian virtues and eternal riches. Needy, lacking in the spirit. So that stood out to me because I, I used to... I have, you know, done some studies about the Sermon of Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So I was like, is that the same word? When God when Jesus says, um, uh, blessed is uh, the poor in spirit, for he is the kingdom of God. Blessed are, he says in plural, blessed are the poor in spirit, because there's is the kingdom of God. And I was like, I went to look for it. I was like, is that the same word? Could it be? And yes, it is the same word. So Jesus is talking about, again, guys, this is a parable. This is a story. But Jesus said, blessed, I mean, not blessed are poor. He says, go out and call in all the poor. And he uses the word that means, you know, financially poor, but also means spiritually poor. He uses the word that he had used, I don't know, a couple days or months ago when he was on that mountain during the Sermon on the Mount. So he, he said, he's saying basically, go out, call the poor. Poor are people who do not have to give back. They don't have a, a way, a, mean, a mean of, means of giving back or, um, you know, they are destitute. They, they have nothing. They lack. So those are the, 
the meanings of this word. You know, they are destitute of virtues and internal values and riches. And I have a question for you. Is there anyone that is not poor like this? Aren't we all? Aren't we all poor like this? None of us, no, not a single one of us have any virtue in ourselves. We can brag about and say, I know, I'm good, I'm done. I, we, we are all poor. We're destitute. We are far from God. We lack, we lack virtues and values and riches that are eternal. We all are poor. Do you agree on that? The second thing, he says, bring me the mead. To be honest, I did not know about this word mead. And I was like, what is this? You know, that's, that's interesting. It's kind of like lame, but since Jesus uses the two words separately, that made me, you know, kind of like, okay, that's interesting. Why is Jesus saying that word? And do the two words, you know, are they alike only or do they have different meaning? So uh, a mean person is someone that's disabled, crippled, injured, wounded, deformed, distorted, disfigured, and twisted out of shape. I think I need to read that again because at least when I was, you know, looking at it instead, I was like, wow. Again, we are looking at it not, not like in a um, literal, literal way. We're looking at it like a metaphor that speaks to us today, okay? So that's why I'm reading it again. Disabled, crippled, injured, wounded, deformed, distorted, disfigured, twisted out of shape. Isn't that what sin has done to us? Isn't that what sin has done to mankind? Sin. Sin has disfigured, distorted, disabled, crippled, injured, twisted us out of shape, disfigured. So that, to me, that's, you know, the perfect example of what has sin done to us. That, that's, that's what was left for us after sin entered the world. The world. So, um, servant, go out, bring the poor, those who have nothing to give back, but also bring the mean. Those who are injured, crippled, wounded. And I love, there's something I love about the Psalms. There are many things I love about the Psalms. But I, I used to teach in a uh, Bible school here in Belo Horizonte. And that... Uh, course about the Psalms and we would look at each and every Psalm that was written by David and we would you know um, try to uh, get understanding of, you know how those Psalms were written in a chronological order and when were they written and all and I remember one day I was studying Psalms uh, 51 Psalms 51 Psalms 51, David says something very interesting. He says, create in me, O God. Create in me, O God. And 
again, I don't know how to pronounce Hebrew or Greek in that case, it's Hebrew. He's a, a word that's spelled B-A-R-A, transliterated for us, of course. It's Hebrew, the Hebrew characters. But he uses when he says create is the very same word used in Genesis 1 1. Genesis 1 1. The beginning, God created heavens and earth. So David uses that. What is he saying? This is so powerful. This is so amazing. What is he saying? He's saying, God, you don't need to have a, a, a substance in your hands to make something out of another thing. To start create. You don't need... You, you create from zero. You create from nothing. You speak and it comes alive. So David was saying, in other words, I don't have a substance for you to form in me a heart, but create in me a clean heart, because that's, that's not difficult for you. You can create out of nothing. So I believe when, you know, in this passage, when the, the, Jesus is, you know, talking about that master sending the servant and calling the the mean the the blind the crippled we're going to talk about the other ones uh, but the poor and here what in other words guys what I want to say to you is sin is never a problem for God in terms of we going towards Him and being accepted by Him sin is not a problem but with Sin was dealt with in the cross. Jesus paid. Sin cannot uh, hinder us. Sin cannot hinder us to go towards God. To be with Him. To have intimacy with Him. Or, or we are disabled, injured, wounded, twisted out of shape. God is restoring us. God is restoring us. Sin was taken care of. Sin was paid for. Jesus paid for our sins. So again, go out and bring them all in. Call them all in. Yes, including the distorted, the disfigured, the wounded. Bring them all in. It's the third, you know, not take but the third person or category. Uh, that Jesus is mentioning that story is go and bring in the lame. Now, again, I think this this whole passage is very interesting. But a person that's lame is deprived of a foot, crippled, or unable to walk. Okay, so. That those are you know things I got from the Hebrew Hebrew word, the meaning of the word lame in he I mean I'm sorry in Greek. Okay, that's New Testament. So deprived of a foot, crippled and unable to walk. We all know that we are in a Christian walk. We have a path before us. We have we have a, um, a walk that we are to pursue, not give up, and really go for it until Jesus comes, you know. Uh, and I was trying to think, what could this mean for us in here? Because, again, it's a story, so we got to search for the meanings that are, you know, kind of like hidden or underlined. Uh, but um, so when, when I don't know maybe what Jesus is trying to tell us because if a person is not able to walk is a crippled person to us that means to be with the Lord 
And there is just one thing that the Bible says that's supposed to light our way to be uh, a sign for us to where we can walk or not walk, and that's the Word of God, right? Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet, right? So the Word of God, the Word of God is what prevents us from being crippled, from being unable to walk, unable to stay stable in that walk of faith. And, but again, I think that's so beautiful because what to us might seem like it's something that disqualifies us. Oh, I, you know, I'm, I stumble so many times. So maybe I can't come. <laughs> oh, I sing so many times. Maybe I'm not really invited. I'm poor. I have nothing to give back. Think that disqualify us. They don't because Jesus is showing us. Call them all. Bring them in. The ones who are, I would say, prohibited to come in are the ones who said, I can't go. I'm sorry. I can't go. But the ones who have problems and, and, and you know, realities and situations that sometimes we as the church look at and think like, uh, you know, that person is, you know, dealing with seeing or stumbling or has nothing to do, has no external values. Those are the very ones that he invites to come. Those are the ones he made a way for. You know, those are the ones he's like, come, come, everything is ready. All is ready. So that's the lane. And I think, I think there's the verse in Hebrew chapter 12. I'm not sure which verse it is, but um, uh, on, verse, on Hebrews 12, the Bible says, uh, for us to strengthen the lane and their weak arms and their walk so that they won't stumble. So God has a strengthening power for us, available for us. It is not like, oh God, I can't, so I, I, I might as well just stay here and I'm not going to you know, go for that intimacy thing because God is so holy, I can't. No, that's because the very fact that he has that strengthening power, that's the very reason we, are, we ought to just go for it and say, God, here I am. I sign up again. I'm here. I might stumble, but you call the lane. You know? I might stumble. I don't care. You call the lane. Here I am. You're looking for a lame one, a poor one? Here. I am that person, disfigured, distorted, wounded. I'm here. I sign up. I want to go. I want to have intimacy with God. That's the beauty of the call to intimacy with the Lord. That is so precious. That's just His heart. Like that's the very center of His uh, being, His affections for us. And now the fourth um, kind of you know, kind of person or characteristic he mentions is the blind. Go out and bring in the blind. Bring in those who cannot see. In Greek, listen to this, this is very interesting. Blind in Greek can be translated into two things. One, blind, you know, naturally, naturally blind in the natural eyes, or mentally blind. Isn't that interesting? And the, the Greek commentary even added something, as if the mind was darkened by smoke. Blind, who can see, but the mentally blind, as if the mind was darkened by smoke. That is interesting. Again, 
We are talking about the people that the uh, master sent the servant to go and, and, and invite and bring in. So, how many of us are not? I mean, how many of us can say we are not blind at something at some point? None of us. We are all blind. We have been, I don't know if you remember, there is a passage in Revelations to one of the churches that God is like, I counsel you to buy um, I saw or something like that. To buy it um, so that your eyes can see again. So that you, you may be able to see. You think you're rich. You think, you know, so uh, that that speaks. I think we should read that verse. Um, Revelations 3, 17. Yes, I have it on my notes. So Revelations chapter 3. If you want to go there with me, please. Revelations 3. Revelations chapter 3, 17 through 20. So, verse 17 says, Because you say, you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see as many as I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Now if we go to verse 22. No, I would like to read verse 20. Is that okay? Verse 20. Verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If some, someone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Verse 22, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I believe When Jesus is asking John to write these letters, I want to point something out to you. He is not writing to the hidden, or I mean, the people who are far from the Lord. He's not talking to unsaved people. That's what I want to say. He's talking to the church, right? Letters to churches. Now here, Jesus comes and says, I stand and knock. I have a question for you. Who's knocking? Jesus is knocking. But when, when someone is knocking at the door, that person is inside or outside? That's a very stupid question, but it's just, I wanted you to think about it. So if I, I have to knock on the door, where am I? Sorry. Outside, right? I'm not inside. Who's inside doesn't need to knock. So Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock. But hold on. Wasn't that better for a church? How come? Why is he knocking? If that's for the church, why is he waiting, standing outside? Those texts really come together in what they want to tell us is not what 
can I say this? Because I, I really, oh, Holy Spirit, help me. What I think the Lord is telling us as the church in general is, it is not what we think is a problem that separates us from God. You know, it's, listen, Jesus was like, you, you think you're rich, but you're blind, you're naked, you're poor, wretched. You know, so those are those things necessarily are not what hinder us from the presence of God. What hinder us from the from the presence of God is our attitude of I lack nothing, I am rich, I am I need nothing. I'm okay. I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> You know, I'm going to think you know what I mean that. And then a sermon comes and I'm talking about all of us, right? Including me. So let's say we are in the church and we hear something and we're like, oh, that's good. I mean, I'm good. You know, I don't have that problem. And then another sermon comes and we're like, ah, oh, no, that's not a hard thing for me. I mean, I've done that. You know, that's... so we, we sometimes are, you know, caught in a, caught up in a, a, a lifestyle of, Looking at us and saying, I don't need that. I don't need that. I'm good. But what that master said to his servant is, don't call those who think they're good enough. Don't call those who think they're, they have it all put together. Call the lame. Call the mean. Call the poor. Call the... the, the the injured, the wounded, the blind. Call the, the ones that know their condition. They are very aware of their condition. They're not, you know, trying to hide it. They actually think, I'm not worthy of being there. Those are the ones I wanted to call because they will take a part of that dinner, that uh, um, feast. And that celebration that God is preparing for us. You know, in the other hand, the ones that are, I'm too busy, you know, I got married, or I bought something that, that you know, I need to work more now. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Again, I think that speaks to us, even in this day, in this age. Things that, you know, draw our attention away from the Lord and to work, to relationships, to pleasures, even though those are not seen in and of themselves, but they become when we, we give away that privilege we have of knowing Jesus. Me and you, we have a privilege of knowing Jesus every day. Tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We have a privilege of knowing Jesus and that is eternal life. The Spirit is saying, I, I, I have no other way to say this, guys, but I know God is saying this. I know the Spirit is calling there is a call, there is an invitation, and God is saying, come for everything is now ready. Everything is ready. Come, come because it is all ready. He has done it all, and he set a table before us, and we are just to come in peace. And I remember, I was not planning on sharing this, but I, but I remember, uh, I have a, a, someone, you know, um, Someone who shared something with me, he had a vision of the throne room of God. Okay, so he's a pastor. He was in a uh, kind of like a spiritual retreat, and he was in prayer and fasting and all. And he had a vision, had a vision of the throne room of God. And even though he couldn't see God's face, he just saw this, you know, brilliant light uh, that almost blinded him, blinding him. Uh, but he saw many precious stones and so many colors and all. 
and he saw people around the throne and he was like, Hakiel, I cannot describe it to you how, because it's not something I saw, but something that I felt in my spirit. He said he was looking at God in the throne and he was so happy, so excited because he was, you know, caught up in that vision. So he's like, you know, in awe of everything. But at the same time, he said that his heart was kind of like sad. A part of his heart was grieving as he was looking at the very face of God. So he's there in the vision, seeing the throne of God, looking at the face of God. He's rejoicing in his spirit because of what he's seen. But at the same time, he's like, oh, something aches. Something aches. Something is sad inside of me. I, I, I wasn't supposed to feel that way. I'm here, you know, face to face with God. Why am I feeling sad? And so he was saying that he was looking around in the vision, seeing people and seeing precious stones and all. And but he, the question, you know, kept you know resounding, echoing in his heart. And at some point, God said to him, the churches are full, but the throne room is empty. Churches are filled with people, but my throne room is empty. And when God told him that, he said, that explains the aching, that pain he was experiencing. Because yes, God was, you know, he was happy to be in the face of God. God was happy to be able to speak to him in that, you know, very experience, super, supernatural experience. But God was sad because sometimes churches are so full of people. But I'm not talking about services. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? I'm not talking about services. I'm talking about intimacy with God. And against intimacy, those three things will show up in your week. Your daily uh, activities, work, relationships, pleasures. Those three things, I promise you, you know that. I promise you. Those three things will show up and be in your face. Like, what are, what are you going to do? Are you going to, you know, take care of what's needed and just for faith or just forget about your life with the Lord? Or will you be a steward of his presence, of that invitation that everything is ready? Come, everything is ready, you know? So I would like for us to just, you know, take a minute uh, if the musicians can come, I would just, I, I, I believe we need to pray, at, you know, after we hear something like this, like this and, and actually like respond, respond at what God is saying. What is God saying to us? Jesus said to a church, I am at the door and I knock. So I would like for us to just, if you can close your eyes, make yourself you know, uh, ready to pray, focus, and really keep your heart open, and just ask God, what is standing in between you and the Lord? What is hindering your walk? What is it pleasure? Is it work? Is it relationship? Is it any relationship? Our relationships, what you use in it as an excuse to say, God, I have relationships, I can't come. I can't show up in that place of intimacy and fellowship with you because I have relationships. Or I have to work or pleasures. And I I I want to say to you this afternoon, get rid of excuses. Please get rid of your excuses. Please, in the name of Jesus, get rid of, of any, any excuses. 
that hinder you from coming closer to the Lord, from leaving a, a life of intimacy and fellowship with the Spirit on a daily basis. Again, this is not something like a, a service, a Sunday uh, night or Sunday morning where you go and it's almost like you, you're swiping in and out, like go to work, okay, here's my, you know, my, my, my duty is done. I went to the service, I heard the sermon. No, there is so much more. There is so much more. And God is calling us to get rid of our excuses, being them pleasures or work or relationships or whatever, and say, God, I, want, I am poor, I am blind, I'm wounded, I have nothing of what takes, of what it takes to be able to be a part of that. But even still, I come. That is why I come, because you invite. You invite the poor. You invite the lame. You invite the blind. So God, yes, that's me. Here I am. And I want to be closer to you. I want to be a part. I want to sit at your table. I want to sit with you and partake and be in fellowship and, and, and be a part of what you have for us as a church. So if you can, just close your eyes. As, you know, the musicians that are going to sing, I want you to just pray and ask God for help. We all need help for that. Help us, Holy Spirit, to desire you more. Help us let, help us get rid of our excuses.